Welcome to worship at Falcon Heights Church on this first Sunday in Lent as we begin a six-week experiment in listening for God. Know that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Our opening verse this week comes from Dag Hammarskjöld, the late Secretary General of the United Nations and Statesman. He writes, I don't know who or what put the question. I don't know when it was put. I don't even remember answering. But at some moment I did answer yes to someone or something. And from that hour I was certain that existence is meaningful and that therefore my life in self-surrender had a goal. Let us begin with a few moments of silence as we recall the presence of God who is with us always. And then we'll sing our opening song. Good morning. Please join me in our opening prayer, which is written by John O'Donohue in the book To Bless the Space Between Us. It's called I Arise Today. I arise today in the name of silence, womb of the word, in the name of stillness, home of belonging, in the name of solitude, of the soul and the earth. I arise today, blessed by all things, wings of breath, delight of eyes, wonder of whisper, intimacy of touch, eternity of soul, urgency of thought, miracle of health, embrace of God. May I live this day compassionate of heart, clear in word, gracious in awareness, courageous in thought, generous in love. Amen. And now we will move into a time of sharing the peace of Christ with one another. So I ask you to turn to those around you and pass the peace of Christ. And I hope that you feel a sense of peace this morning.
And now I would invite the children who are tuning in to come a little closer to the monitor and have a conversation with me for just a few minutes. So the story that we're reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark from the very first chapter and it's only six verses long but there's a lot of things happening in those six verses. There's a lot going on in the story. It moves really really quickly from one thing to the next which actually happens a lot in Mark's gospel. But part of this story talks about Jesus being driven out into the wilderness and experiencing temptation. And I was wondering if you know what temptation means. What is temptation? I thought I knew what temptation was, but it turns out I had a hard time putting it into words. So, after a lot of thinking, I came up with this. Temptation is a desire to do something, especially when that something is not aligned with our most authentic, our most divine selves, or even something that's just out of the norm from the way we would normally act or do things. And I think a lot of times the word temptation is used as a bad thing to say that someone did something wrong or is something wrong. And I think sometimes when we give into temptation, when we do things we ordinarily wouldn't or make a mistake, we start to feel bad about ourselves. I know when I give into temptation and I, I don't know, I order food when I have a full fridge of things to make for dinner, I start feeling bad that I spent money, that I had somebody else go and get it for me and deliver it to my house. You know, it's a simple example, but I think there that sometimes we can start to feel really bad about some of the mistakes we made or the choices that we make. Like maybe we've done something wrong or made a mistake. And because of that, that we're bad people. But that's not true. And luckily this story tells us that, that we are not bad people. In fact, just before Jesus is driven out into the wilderness and he's tempted, Jesus was baptized. And during his baptism, a spirit that comes down from heaven speaks to him and says, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And I like to think of that as a message that carries throughout the rest of the story. And I think that Jesus remembered this when he was in the wilderness, feeling tempted to make choices that he normally wouldn't. No mistakes we make or wrong decisions we make can take away our belovedness. And so the next time that you make a mistake or a choice that doesn't align with who you are, doesn't align with your authentic, divine, best self, and you will. We all make mistakes. It's just part of being human. When you make a mistake, I want you to remember that you are beloved by God. You are beloved by God. And by Falcon Heights Church and by your friends and family and so many others. And doing something wrong or making a mistake or making a choice that maybe isn't the best one doesn't mean that you are any less beloved. It doesn't mean that you are a bad person. It just means that you are experiencing growing pains and that you're learning. So I was hoping that this week you can try and remember that. And I know it's hard to, to remember. It's hard to remember to think about our belovedness in times when we've made mistakes. But 
I'll be trying to remember that too, so you won't be doing it alone. And I think if we really think about that and we really believe that, that we might experience real grace and real peace and real love and joy. So I hope you feel that this week. Peace and blessings, my friends. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. The reading for today is from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Here ends the reading. How do you listen for God? What helps you to listen more deeply? Poet and philosopher Mark Nepo asks what it means to follow our intuition. What kind of listening are we asked to engage in order to sense what is calling and whether we should follow? It begins with a poem. What if, on the first sunny day, on your way to work, a colorful, a colorful bird sweeps in front of you down a street you've never heard of? You pause and smile, a sweet beginning to your day. Or you might step into that street and realize there are many ways to work. You might sense the bird knows something you don't and wander after. You might hesitate when the bird turns down an alley. For now there is a tension. Is what the bird knows worth being late? You might go another block or two, thinking you can have it both ways. But soon you arrive at the edge of all your plans. The bird circles back for you, and you must decide which appointment you were born to keep. He continues, Mark Nepo does, and says, at every turn in every day, we are presented with angels in a thousand guises, each calling to us to follow their song. There is no right or wrong way to go, and only your heart can find the appointments you were born to keep. It's hard to take this risk, but meeting, with, meeting each uncertainty with an open heart will lead us to an authentic tomorrow. This open-hearted approach to life that Nepo talks about is very much in line with what I've been telling you for a while now about becoming more aware of how God is showing up in the daily ordinariness of our lives. Our Lenten theme this year is listening for God in Lent. And Nepo is a cancer survivor who began to lose his hearing as a result of his chemotherapy regimen more than 20 years ago. And in the book called 7,000 Ways to Listen, he speaks of listening as a full body, multi-sensory experience. He writes, what we call listening is actually an innate process that integrates an array of sensations we encounter through different ways of knowing, sight, smell, touch, taste, and sound. What we hear is the sum of life's vibrations. 
We often think of Jesus' time in the desert as a kind of heroic act he is compelled to perform that sets a high bar you and I can never reach. And this allows us to keep what he did safely within the pages of our Bibles and out of our lives. If Jesus' example is unattainable, then we don't have to hear it addressed directly to us as an invitation, kind of like the bird in the poem I read. Or we turn the story of Satan testing Jesus into this albatross of legalism hung around our necks, a demand for self-denial that is really more like a self-rejection rather than a doorway to God. I mean, personally, I think that Lent is a useless season if it doesn't open us to a deeper experience of grace. So I want to propose something to you. I want to propose an experiment in thinking um, as we re-understand the story of Jesus' temptation in the desert in Mark. As the story begins, Jesus is simply responding to that metaphorical bird that flies in front of him on his way to work one day. And his entire life and ministry are just simply him discovering a series of appointments he was born to keep. What if we sort of approach the story in that way? I mean, think of it. The way Mark lays it out in three vignettes in our reading today, Jesus hears John the Baptist preaching by the riverside and then decides to go get baptized along with the others. And yes, the Spirit does descend on him from above as he comes up out of the water, and a voice from heaven does call him beloved. But without his responding to each of these invitations, these appointments with his destiny, none of this ever would have happened. You see, I think we're deeply affected, you and I, by the way that the story gets told all the time, the way that we may have first heard it, with us already knowing the outcome. And Mark adds to this outcome the idea that this was all somehow pre-planned, meant to be by God. God's intention for Jesus from the very beginning, like God knew it all. But what if God, interacting with us in our free will, What if it's more like God takes a risk? Each time, God presents an invitation. Will we answer it? Will we respond? I mean, I think, I wonder how Jesus experienced this series of invitations at the time that he did. You know how our life can often slide by without our really noticing it? That's especially happened during this pandemic for me, and maybe it's been the same for you. One day sort of blends into another, and our lives have gotten so small in the number of activities and limited in the scope of them, with nothing special to look forward to. But maybe something has happened for you over the course of the last almost year of being restricted in our movements in order not to spread the virus. I wonder if maybe, like me, your awareness has developed of the moments that we savor. Or maybe what if we were to develop our awareness of the invitations that come from God in each moment? Invitations to wonder, invitations to entering in to an experience or just a simple appreciation? What if we took a few minutes out of our day before we go to bed to note the high event or the low event of each day? Another way to think of that is the moments that we most felt the presence of God and the least, or the experience during the day where we gave and received the most love, and the moment or the experience where that happened the least. You and I might soon find ourselves pausing in the middle of our day to notice a bright moment in a phone call or a text from a friend or the song of a bird or the angle of the afternoon sun as the days get longer 
and we emerge from the dark of winter, as we're doing now. Margot Olson from our worship ministry team put together a simple Lenten calendar which we can put on our refrigerator and where we can write down a word or two in each day's square on the calendar of where we listened for and heard from God, where we sensed the presence of the sacred that day, just as a reminder that God showed up. It's a PDF that you can download from our website or the tab and print out. And I think Shannon is printing hard copies that are going to be mailed out to all of those who receive a printed tab newsletter. I think Jesus responds in the way that he does because he is tuned in to listen for God, to still his inner life long enough and often enough, to hear the invitation to come down to the riverbank, into the wilderness, onto the roads of Galilee, and into the synagogues and houses of faithful people, and into the centers of power in Jerusalem, and ultimately even to a cup of death and a cross and a resurrection. What do our lives hold if we were to listen with our whole selves? And if what we hear was to find a home inside of us, how might that change us? You and I are invited to find out in this Lenten listening journey. Will you take it with me? Amen. Our prayer this morning is a prayer adapted um, that's originally by Ted Loder in the collection titled Gorillas of Grace. Let us pray. O oh God, we come to you now as a child to our mother, out of the cold which numbs into the warm who cares. Listen to us inside, under our words, where the shivering is, in the fears which freeze our living, in the angers which chafe our attending, in the doubts which chill our hoping, in the events which shrivel our thinking, in the pretenses which stiffen our loving. Listen to us, Lord, as a mother, and hold us warm and forgive us. Soften our experiences into wisdom, our pride into acceptance, our longing into trust, and soften us into love and to others and to you. Listen to us, O oh God, as we pray for others, some whom we know intimately and others whom we know only of, but whom you know and hold close to your heart.
Thank you for hearing our prayers, spoken and unspoken. For we offer them in the name of Jesus, with whom we pray, our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I want to extend a huge thank you for your generosity in giving to our RIP medical debt campaign. Uh, a joint effort that we had with St. Anthony Park, United Church of Christ. 38 people from our congregation gave a total of $8,195. And between our two churches, we exceeded our $15,000 target. And we'll have a final total to tell you soon of how much debt relief we achieved in Minnesota, Wisconsin, North Dakota, and South Dakota. Thank you for relieving the weight of medical debt from many, many people in these four states. Our worship life is a collective practice. It's something homegrown where we share elements throughout the week and they go into the final edited version of our pre-recorded worship service, which Shannon Kaiser, our office manager, works so well to bring together each week. During Lent, I want to invite you to share some photos or artwork that you may have, a poem or some words that remind you of listening as a way of opening us up to the themes this month in our Lenten listening emphasis. We'll share them in a worship service or in the tab for all to see, read, and receive. Readers are needed, too, for the scripture and contemporary reading each week. Sign up online to read on a Sunday. You can record it, either audio or video, on your phone or computer, and upload it to Dropbox so that Shannon can include it in the worship service. Details are in the tab, or you can give Shannon, uh, send Shannon an email to get the details of how to upload it. But we're looking for expanding our number of readers through this pandemic um, through being able to record and send them in. We look forward to receiving these things from you. Each day, God invites us to listen for grace, to notice abundance, and respond to what we hear, feel, see, smell, and touch. Every moment is filled with all the fullness of God. We answer God's question to us, God's invitation by how we welcome, embrace them, and live. Thank you.
Let us pray. God of all bounty and blessing, receive our lives and our gifts to be bounty and blessings to you, our church, and the world around us. Amen.